Hello everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to begin our conversation of period eight. Um, so last time we finished off period seven with a pretty clear dividing line, the ending of World War II uh, in 1945, but that line where it definitely is a good one to end a period and start a new one, there's going to be a little bit of aftermath we're going to have to clean up as we start period eight because the, the events that will animate a lot of what we talk about in period eight, most notably the Cold War, they start basically as soon as the war itself ends. So today we'll kind of be looking at that, like what are the longer term impacts of World War II as we move forward, and then as we go forward in period eight, uh, we will see how that Cold War evolves and change over, changes over time because for an event that takes uh, about 50 or so years, not quite, to resolve, um, it certainly means that we're going to see some different periods in this over time. And in fact, we won't even technically get to the end of the Cold War in period eight. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And as we usually do at the beginning of the unit, let's look at our key concepts. Um, so key concept 8.1 is really where we're going to be for today. Um, the United States responded to an uncertain and unstable post-war world by asserting and working to maintain a position of global leadership with far-reaching domestic and international consequences. So that is one that we're going to get into today, but that is going to go throughout basically any time we're talking about foreign policy. We're mostly going to be talking in that area, 8.1. Uh, next one, 8.2, also a major focus of period 8. New movements for civil rights and liberal efforts to expand the role of government generated a range of political and cultural responses. This is period 8 where we will talk about the civil rights movement um, from 1954 or 56 to uh, its culmination in 1965. But we will also talk about other movements outside of the African American civil rights movement that began in period 8. Um, then we will also start to talk by the end of the unit, kind of some of the backlash of uh, this growth in government programs that we see start to appear by the end of period eight, and that will become really important as we move forward into period nine. And then 8.3, post-war economic and demographic changes had far-reaching consequences for American society, politics, and culture. Uh, we won't get into that one so much today, but we will start talking about the economy uh, by the end of this week. And then we will start talking about a lot of demographic changes by the time we get to the Great Society um, as America becomes more diverse and uh, those... Um, Barriers to entry that were set up for immigrants starting in the 1920s begin to be lifted and uh, America begins to allow a lot more um, folks into the country, which has massive demographic impacts. But that one we won't get into so much today. That'll be later in the unit. All right, so let's start, though, and we're going to start kind of almost where we left off, talking about Truman and his presidency, now that the war is over, and how he confronts this these early stages in what we come to call the Cold War. And then, uh, not today, but later in the unit, uh, or later this week, we'll start talking about the Second Red Scare as these fears of communism come home to roost domestically. But we haven't started the Cold War yet, so let's begin that first. Now, after World War II... We are, simply put, the most powerful and prosperous country in the world. It's not really even that close of a decision. Um, in the year 1947, just two years after the war ends, half of the manufactured goods produced in the entire world are produced in the United States. 57% 50 of all the steel produced in the world produced in the United States. 43% of all the electricity produced in the world is in the United States. 60% of all the oil produced is from the United States. This shows us that, of course, while we did face some, some hardship during the war, we faced casualties during the war, simply put because not much of the fighting occurs on American soil and none in the American homeland, our economic power that was 
waning before the war but grew because of the war and brought us out of the Depression is going to continue to grow as we move closer to the 1950s. Now, we are going to contrast that with the rise of the other superpower, which, as you guys know, is going to be the USSR, the Soviet Union. What was their story in the aftermath? Um, heavy losses in the war, uh, not just of money and material, but, yes, in lives, millions upon millions of soldiers, millions upon millions of civilians killed um, during the Nazis, Nazi invasions that began in 1941, uh, and the wars that continued as the Russians uh, liberated those areas uh, as we moved into 1944 and 1945. It's never going to be sure, but I'll show you the graph again, but certainly around 20 million dead on, uh, from the Soviet Union. Soldiers, civilians, the undesirables that the Nazis sought out and killed as part of their final solution for the Jewish problem and all these other problems of undesirables in Europe, okay? Obviously, two very, very different experiences of the same war. It's pretty clear, based on this, why we act differently. And these initial actions we're taking, some cases, not even before the war even itself ended, but these different perspectives lead us to take different actions and the Soviets to take different actions, right? We, seeing, hey, good times are back again, we're seeing our prosperous economy, and we just want that to grow. Well, we want to create a world order that will be peaceful and prosperous so that we can grow our economy as part of a leadership of that world order. The Soviets, on the other hand, very much have a different perspective in which they do not want to get into another war like World War II, but instead of trying to promote some sort of peace to do it, they want to make sure they're safe if that requires more force right now as the war is ending. Most notably, they want a buffer zone in Eastern Europe to protect themselves from a future invasion. In this case, as the war is ending, not looking like it's going to be Germany again. Germany is very much uh, dealt a severe blow here, and uh, their powers to make a military will be sharply curtailed. Um, unlike they were at the end of World War I. But if you're Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, you're not thinking so much about the invasion of a Germany, a revived Germany, but perhaps the Western allies, of which at least Churchill and maybe Truman have already started to show some antagonism towards you. You don't want to see all that death and destruction again, so maybe having an Eastern European buffer zone would be a good idea for you, even if you have to take it by force. This story of sacrifice, which in reality, both of our sacrifices, the United States' uh, economic um, and kind of industrial pushes that it did as we got into the war, the massive loss of life as the Soviets were fighting without those weapons for so long until the, near the end of the war where they did have some more success. That's why we respond differently. Even though in that moment, our goal was the singular goal to defeat Nazi Germany, once Nazi Germany is gone, now we're going to have to deal with the aftermath of that. Um, yeah, because, I mean, we both had our sacrifices. Ours, obviously, a lot different in terms of the cost of the war for us. We spend more money on the war than anyone else because we're fighting in Europe and in the Pacific. Um, but then when you just look at the numbers, um, just shy of 300,000, making it the most deadly war outside of the American Civil War, which is the deadliest war because we're fighting against ourselves. Um, but even then, 300,000 military killed or missing is, is just nothing compared to 13.6 million of, of soldiers, uh, 8 million civilians, whereas we don't really have any civilians die in the war. Yeah. Now, the creation of these buffer zones in Eastern Europe began basically as they were being liberated uh, during the war itself. Now, the Soviets, as they pushed into Eastern Europe, the Balkans, closer and closer to Germany, there was an understanding on the part of the Allies that this was a temporary situation, that they were liberating these areas from the Nazi control, and that when peace came back to Europe, this stuff would be 
undone and that we would be going back towards, you know, a, a more status quo uh, of peace in Europe. But that was never Stalin's intention, and, and we saw that as soon as uh, the Yalta Conference in July of 1945, uh, where Stalin, who had promised to allow free and fair elections in these areas and allow the formation of self-determined governments, already by the summer of 1945 is using tactics like um, getting communist officials in these uh, occupied states to imprison liberal and conservative opponents of communism, censoring newspapers that might be critical of Stalin and the communists, uh, local communists, and creation of state-controlled radio stations to begin broadcasting propaganda in support of the Soviet Union. Um, we also start to see the development of guards, uh, especially near the borders of these occupied areas, to prevent people from escaping to Western Europe. And all of this is beginning in late 1945, moving into 1946, as the, the war is, is barely over. Now, again, if you were Stalin and you're looking from Stalin's perspective, it's only logical to be expanding the influence of, of the Soviet Union further and further west and planting these flags elsewhere. Um, and the thing is, is that while it may come off as simply, you know, Stalin and the communists exerting their influence, there is a reality here that in Europe, there are a lot of people in the Western states that also are communist. Um, for a lot of reasons, but one that's probably the most notable is that like in a country like France, as the war ends, unemployment is high, the economy is not great, large parts of their industrial capacity are completely in shambles, they've been blown up by the Nazis, so people aren't working and people are not really having a good or easy time trying to feed themselves and their families or get housing or shelter. And so uh, these areas... Uh, while it seems like it's completely, you know, Soviet bullying, um, there is a, a, a large aspect of folks that in those areas that are very happy to be kind of forced into communism in a way. Now, these actions, which are happening very, very rapidly, are very concerning, and they're given voice most notably by Winston Churchill. Now, by this point in 1946, Churchill's on a speaking tour because he's actually out of the prime ministership at this moment. Uh, he kind of had a falling out uh, as the war was ending. He left the prime ministership. He will go back in the early 50s. But at this point, he's a private citizen, but he's still raising the alarm about Stalin, a guy he had close personal contact with, and what he sees are Stalin's ambitions. And to his point... He gives a speech at a college in Fulton, Missouri, where he coins this idea of the Iron Curtain. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all our subjects, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from, uh, from Moscow. Now, most of the Eastern European states, I'm going to go back to this map to show you, um, most of the Eastern European states, so here we're talking about Poland, the Romania, um, Czechoslovakia, they are not part of the Soviet Union. They are independent states, led by communist officials and communist governments, but they're independent from the Soviet Union. Only those parts you see kind of in that uh, medium red are actually annexed into the Soviet Union proper following World War II. Now, with that said, though, these are satellite states, meaning that while they're not necessarily part of the overall Soviet government, they kind of do exactly what the Soviet government asked them to do, right? So while they're nominally independent, are they truly independent? No, they are not. They will act upon what the Soviet Union tells them, um, even if, in some cases, it's against their own self-interest as a nation. 
Now, this development of the Iron Curtain you see here, I want to be very clear, the Iron Curtain is not an actual thing. It's not like an actual barrier. It is a philosophical idea that, you know, there are guards on some level, you know, protecting the crossing over this Iron Curtain, but it's not an actual physical barrier. There is an example of one later, but I'll get to the Berlin Wall in a minute. Uh, but you see here what the Iron Curtain is in that on the eastern side of that curtain is the eastern bloc uh, led by the Soviet Union. The western half of that is the western bloc led by the United States through NATO. More on that later. And then there are some neutral countries. Uh, Sweden, Finland stayed neutral. Switzerland stays neutral in this. Um, uh, then also some interesting stories like Yugoslavia which is a very interesting situation where it is technically a communist government, but the guy uh, who leads that government, Joseph Tito, uh, does so kind of on his own accord and sometimes goes against what the Soviet Union wants. But the basic idea here is that you do have that dividing line now between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Uh, on one side in Eastern Europe, you have a communist form of government, on the other side, in Western Europe, you have democratic forms of government and capitalist economies. Now, as these stories begin to pile up, because, I mean, it's not like it's a light switch. It's like, oh, this government turned to communism, and this government turned to communism, and was Stalin involved, and were the Soviets pressuring them? It's a drip, drip, drip of stories from 1945 into 1946, and as, as those stories come out, the tension between the United States and the Soviet Union continues to grow. And that post-war optimism, which did exist for a while in the summer and fall of 1945, begins to turn to suspicion and, and kind of, you know, uh, fear of one another. Now, at that time, uh, Truman's uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, former Vice President under FDR, Henry Wallace, he argued we need to be restrained in this moment, right? Now, Wallace was a little bit more on the left of the sides. He was a little bit more liberal than uh, FDR was. Um, this led some to say he was a sympathizer with the Soviets, although I don't know if that's necessarily true. But Wallace will lay out here what was kind of the point that I was making, um, that, you know, of course, with how the war ended for the Soviets... Um, whether or not it was a good thing for these people to be under communist control, I think in retrospect we can say probably not, if not absolutely not. Um, it's also not so surprising that this occurred, okay? Um, as Wallace put it, quote, getting tough, never bought anything real and lasting, whether for the schoolyard bullies or world powers. The tougher we get, the tougher the Russians will get. So he's saying let's, let's chill out, let's not, you know, get too crazy with it. Because maybe if we get tougher, they're going to respond and it's going to make things worse, not a lot better. With that said, though, Wallace is the minority opinion in the U.S. government this time. And the growing majority opinion is that the U.S. does need to respond and with some force. Now, the first guy who really got out there and started making this argument was this guy, George Kennan. He was uh, a work for the State Department. And he had been an expert in the Soviet affairs long before World War II. Um, and now the war is over, his expertise on what the Soviet Union was about and what the communist system was about uh, is going to come back to the fore. Uh, now, Keenan, he argued, and, you know, he was right here, although how much his actions helped to make this happen is uh, arguable. But he does say that the U.S. and Soviet Union are going to be antagonists for you know, as far ahead in the future we can actually predict, okay? The reason why is because of a clearly different ideology than what is held in the United States. Now, we've talked about this a little bit already, but the fact is, is that Soviets, they are communists. They have a communist ideology. They believe that, commu uh, that the people should own the means of production, the ways that things are made in the economy, factories, farms, land, all these things. And that the people will hold these um, through their government, all right? Um, in this, 
There is no room for private enterprise or capitalism like we would know in the United States. And while the Soviets themselves would say, no, this isn't true, uh, because they would say there is democratic government because anyone can join the party and have a say-so, um, in reality, if you went against what the Communist Party wanted, you had no way to join a second party. There was only one party allowed. Um, and that if you disagreed too much, especially in public, you may face severe consequences for that. And then finally, yes, many Soviets and communists made a clear point that the communism wasn't supposed to just be in the Soviet Union. Stalin might have believed that, but many communists said that it is supposed to be a world revolution that spreads everywhere, and that to this point, looking at the conquest of Eastern Europe and the kind of taken away of self-determination, could be seen as just step one in further expansion of a communist system. As Keenan put it, the outside world was hostile to the Soviets, and that it was their duty eventually to overthrow the political forces beyond their borders. Okay? Now, Keenan will publish an article in a magazine called Foreign Affairs, still around today, which is about, you guessed it, Foreign Affairs. Um, and in this uh, article, which uh, technically was published um, anonymously by Mr. X, um, because Keenan didn't want to like have his name attached to this public article because he was just kind of a, a middle to high type dude in the government. He doesn't want you know everything being attached to him. But it doesn't really matter. In the end, we find out that he wrote this and that he, therefore, gets the credit for this idea of containment. As what he said the United States ought to do is pursue, quote, a long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment. By this, what we mean is a stopping and blocking the expansion of Soviet influence in Europe, but eventually this idea would come to be true everywhere. To quote Keenan one final time, quote, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy towards the Soviet Union must be that of long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansiveness, expansive tendencies. That's about it. Now, this was based upon this. In SC-68, a report to the National Security Council that Keenan himself had worked on, uh, this came out uh, in 1950, um, after that article, uh, with a clear policy on how would this containment be pursued. Now, there were several things made in this, at that time, private classified document. Uh, one, the USSR was in a superior military position, particularly in Europe, given their proximity um, to uh, the countries of Europe. Um, that, two, that realignment of the two superpowers uh, was not temporary. It was going to be there for at least the near future, as far as anyone can predict. Three, lined out the objectives of the USSR. One, uh, to strengthen its preeminent position as the ideological and power center of the communist world, which was certainly true, but they're trying to strengthen it. Two, extend its power through the acquisition of satellite states, like in Eastern Europe. And three, to undermine any competing system that threatens communist world order, like, I don't know, a democratic and capitalist uh, uh, competing system. What are the recommendations? One, uh, the U.S. and its allies had to create an immediate, like right now, and large-scale buildup of the military and general strength in order to avoid uh, falling on the wrong side of this power balance and therefore uh, basically opening us up to all-out war yet again once the Soviets saw our weakness, okay? Um, and what this would mean, and this is really important, we are changing our goal from national security, which had been the goal of the United States ever since we were formed. Even during World War II, uh, a lot of the reasons why we were fighting were couched as we were trying to protect the United States and its citizens. But in order to prevent an all-out war that might be even more destructive, we had to commit to global security and peace. That's how you prevent the next war, not being isolationist and worrying about just ourselves. Now, all of those are ideas. Those are all things that, you know, smart folks are trying to think out and plan out, but where does the murder meet the road? Where does this containment actually play out? Well, we see that 
Eastern Europe, which unfortunately falls very quickly to Soviet influence, is not where they wanted to end their influence. They're looking at new places. Uh, the next area in 1947 that we're seeing kind of a threat of Russian expansionism is uh, a little further south in the Balkans and in the Middle East, Greece and Turkey, to uh, uh, non-communist governments, somewhat aligned to the Allies uh, and the Western powers, but at this point, not too much. Now, this is an area where we, we did not have a whole lot of direct influence, though. And that really wasn't anything about us. It was more that we were looking at and trying to respect the foreign policy and the actions taken by one of our allies, the U.K., the UK had provided a lot of the financial assistance to help rebuild post-World War II and try to defend themselves against possible Soviet invasion. But it becomes pretty clear that that's going to change in February of 1947 when the British would deliver a couple notes to the U.S. State Department that says it out loud something that we feared, that they lack the resources to aid Greece and Turkey. And that's they can't help anymore. Now, as one American official put it at a later point, he said, quote, Great Britain had within the hour handed the job of world leadership with all its burden and all its glory to the United States. Now, the duty of protecting Greece and Turkey and perhaps any other country in threat of a communist takeover is now on our shoulders. Now we're the top dog. Now, Truman acts quickly and accepts this responsibility. In March of 1947, he will call Congress together, a special joint session, asking for $400 million in military and economic aid to help Greece and Turkey resist Soviet aggression. Now, that is not where he stopped, though, right? He would go further and allow this idea to be applied not just in these two particular instances, but perhaps elsewhere also. Um, as what one historian, John Spanier, put it, uh, who would call this, quote, one of the most important speeches in American history, Truman would articulate essentially what we now call the Truman Doctrine. To put it in Truman's own words, quote, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugations by armed minorities or by outside pressure. That is what's happening in Greece and Turkey, but by no means is that only happening in Greece and Turkey. It's going to happen in different places in different parts of the world as well. But now we're committed to this through Truman's words. Now, what are the consequences of all of this? Well, one, um, Congress easily agrees to Truman's uh, approve, uh, request, gives them that money, gives that money over for military and economic aid to Greece and Turkey, and that worked. That did work. Uh, ultimately, uh, both Greece and Turkey never fell to Soviet expansion by either you know, direct warfare or otherwise you know, covert elements. But the Truman Doctrine well and truly means we're in the Cold War. And depending on what historian you'll ask, some would say that we were already in the Cold War by, before the Truman Doctrine occurred. But certainly everyone's going to agree the Cold War has begun by the time of this Truman Doctrine. Um, and it is going to be a prolonged conflict in many different arenas. Economic conflict, political conflict, technological conflict, ideological conflict, and in some cases, yes, military conflict on smaller scales. Um, in this, we play the role of the leader of the free world, using our power and our strength and our economic and military might to, uh, to limit the spread of communism throughout the world, whereas the Soviets will be mostly, for at least especially in this early period, focus on expanding their influence across the globe. This is going to be the primary tenet of American foreign policy for a generation. Uh, foreign policy from 1947 all the way to 1991 is just completely consumed with this Cold War and the problems that come from it. Now, this is a long period of time. Um, and all, through period eight, we're going to talk about everything that you see on this list of timelines. Um, 
of things that we're doing, things the Soviet Union are doing. Um, but we're, we're going to not talk about this as one big unit because that would take us through multiple presidencies, multiple you know decades, and it wouldn't really make sense chronologically speaking. But the point that I need to make here, though, is that we're really only talking about like the first bit here from like 1945 to 1950 today. We're not going to get much further than that. So this idea of the Cold War is one that you're going to need to recognize as a theme throughout period eight. And then it's also going to be around as we begin period nine as well, although it will resolve uh, pretty quickly after we start that last unit in the A-Push class. So just know we're going to hit on all these things, um, but that this is a period of time that's much longer than just a short, brief amount of time, like you know, World War II is from 1939 to 1945. The Cold War if, is not really a war in the way that we would talk about the ones before this. Um, it's certainly a conflict, though, and it's going to last a much longer time. Now, let's finish up today by looking at this containment policy and how it plays out in Europe in its early years. Now, of course, as I mentioned, Greece and Turkey are just the beginning here. There were other countries that needed aid as well. Um, and in this, we're not looking at the countries necessarily just close to the Soviet Union, but some that were Western countries that were our allies long before, right? Uh, we've talked about, I talked about France as an example of this, uh, is an area where um, there are a lot of homeless families, uh, a lot of broken and destroyed cities, so like, there's no housing, there's not jobs, the factories are destroyed. So not only do people not have jobs, they don't have the goods that you know are produced by those factories, and it's leading a lot of folks uh, to become angry, and some to even like organically start to say, "Hey, perhaps we want communism as our form of government to you know make sure these needs are met, no matter what." Now, obviously, our intervention in Western Europe is a little different because we don't necessarily need that military aid as much as we need the economic aid to kind of turn around the spirits of the people and keep them from looking at radical ideologies like communism. And that understanding was figured out by this guy, George Marshall. Now, George Marshall, during World War II, was one of the lead generals, worked closely with Eisenhower in Europe, after the war, he was chosen to be Truman's Secretary of State, and in this, kind of in this diplomatic uh, uh, situation, he's going to say, listen, we, we, we got to help Europe reconstruct itself, and not like, it, like some future point, but like right, right now. And so in the summer of 1947, as a speech he gives at Harvard, he lays out the, the idea for what we come to call the Marshall Plan after him. Basically, what these, uh, the Marshall Plan would do is it would give a ton of money, uh, by the end, almost $13 billion worth, uh, to rebuild countries in actually all of Europe, uh, but mostly that money is going to go to Western Europe. Okay? Now, technically, all of the funds were open to any country that had been affected by destruction from World War II. So, in theory, this money could be accepted by the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc states. However, the Soviet Union makes it very clear uh, that they will not accept the money, nor uh, will they allow their Eastern European allies and the satellite states to do the same. So most of this money goes to the countries of Western Europe, most notably the UK and France. Uh, but this money, which we give, uh, uh, some of it's loans, some of it's just straight money. We just give them money completely turns around their economy within four years. Uh, industrial production uh, actually uh, is higher uh, within four years, so by 1951, than it was uh, before the war even, 41% higher. Um, and as you know, the economies are rebuilt, people get jobs, they're able to start to meet those basic needs and start to get manufactured goods and these other creature comforts, and then all of a sudden, almost as through magic, places like France, you don't hear the words of, like, communism, people wanting to be, uh, you know, kind of turn over to this, this radical form of government. No, they're pretty content because the economy's working for them, but the only reason why that was is because we gave them a ton of money. Um, with that said, though, this is another way to contain communism and spread uh, further and further west. It makes our allies in Western Europe more powerful, 
and keeps communism from spreading there. Now, of course, though, that economic aid is one thing, but there is a, an understanding that an, another war could occur. Um, if the Soviets at that point wanted to invade Western Europe, it would be very hard to stop them, okay? And so a couple years later, the third bit of the so-called containment policy in Europe will come through with the creation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, this would have uh, the United States, or neighbors to the north, Canada, and then at first, 10 European countries on uh, the North Atlantic to start to join this defensive alliance of Western European and American countries. Now, this is what NATO looked like in 1990. Obviously, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO has grown to many of the member nations of Europe. Not all, but many of them are a part of NATO today. Um, but, again, is a defensive alliance. Uh, and this was about collective security. If you remember back when we talked about World War I, that was the main idea behind the League of Nations, collective security. If any one member is attacked, all members will attack, right? That is what's in Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and that was approved by the United States uh, Senate in something that, you know, a decade before they wouldn't have approved. But now the situation has changed so much to allow this provision to be part of an of a organization that we're in. Now, in reality... Um, this, which is absolutely a rejection of, of the League of Nations and isolationism, actually kind of did what it was supposed to do and probably what it would have done under the League of Nations if it was followed strictly. The Soviet Union never did invade Europe during the Cold War. That never happened. Um, not completely, but maybe at least in part because of this collective security provision. Now, NATO has actually only ever activated this collective security provision one time in its history, and that actually was after the Cold War. Um, it was September 11, 2001, when the United States was attacked uh, as a terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and that uh, uh, led the United States to call on all the members of NATO to help us with the invasion of Afghanistan, which the member states did. But that was the only time that we've ever used it up to this point, although technically NATO's still around and we could use it again in the future if we needed to. Now, as in so many things, our action here causes like an equal and opposite reaction in the Soviet bloc. And just like we have our collective security alliance, so too does the Soviet Union create theirs with their uh, satellite states in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, what they call the Warsaw Pact, which would, just like NATO, connect the Soviet Union with seven other European countries that would commit to uh, working together and defending each other in the case of an invasion. So now we're just both. we got our guns pointed and we're saying, listen, you come, we're starting to shoot uh, on both sides uh, to try and, you know, either stop each other from doing this or prepare each other for the possibility this could happen and what we would do next. Now let's zoom in on Germany. Now as the war ended in 1945, uh, when times were still good and we were still getting along as allies, uh, we divided Germany up into four zones. Uh, one for each of the allies. So we controlled uh, one part, the UK controlled a part, the uh, French controlled apart, and then the Soviets controlled apart, right? Now, what you see here in this image, though, is not the state of Germany, but rather Berlin itself. Now, Berlin, the capital of Germany, uh, was in the eastern part of Germany that was liberated by the Soviets at the close of World War II. Um, and much like uh, the whole of Germany, uh, Berlin itself was divided into four constituent parts, one controlled by us, one by the British, one by the French, one by the Soviets. Now, this map up here, though, the top one, shows you the problem there. Berlin is completely surrounded by East Germany, which is going to be controlled by 
the Soviets. This came to be um, in 1948, um, after, uh, at this point, the uh, new countries of West Germany and East Germany had been formed or were on the way to being formed. And Berlin itself is now said divided into two as the Americans, British, and French combined their uh, three sections into one, um, a new German republic uh, with uh, most of its within West Germany, but with that part of West Berlin, also part of this West Germany as well. Now, there was a fear here upon Stalin on what a stronger Germany would look like and how this may be just the first step in more aggression from his former allies in Western Europe. Uh, and to this point, Stalin would cut off West Berlin. And he could do that because all the area around West Berlin was under the control of the satellite state of East Germany. And sure enough, uh, this blockade was remarkably effective um, the 2.2 million people living in West Berlin under democratic and free, you know, government, they only had about 45 days worth of coal, uh, which once uh, was used for heating and cooking, you know, uh, heating especially in the wintertime, food for only 36 days. And so the fear was is that with this blockade, soon and very soon, West, Ger West Berlin is going to fall under Soviet influence because they have to eat, and now you would have a kind of unified East Germany under Soviet leadership. So what to do? This is really the first time that we have to respond. We can't just allow this to happen. It's not exactly a war, but we can't just let the Soviets do whatever, or this containment policy might completely fall apart. Um... So Truman realizes he has to do something. So what did Truman do? He said, quote, we are going to stay, period. And he begins a massive airlift using air bases in Western Europe. Uh, we'll start uh, loading up former bomber planes with supplies, uh, food, uh, you know, oil, coal, uh, clothing, all this stuff, even toys for the kids. You see the kids would, would gather for the planes to come over um, and drop it on Berlin. Now, this would be tons and tons of food and fuel, 4,500 tons of food, food and fuel a day, which very quickly uh, got them past the problems of this blockade. They very soon had enough for everyone living there, the 2.2 million people. And at that point, Stalin has to take an L. He realizes that he lost this exchange, that the blockade was not working uh, and would fail as long as Truman continues sending those planes in. Tr Stalin didn't want to accelerate this by shooting down American planes flying over Berlin. And so the blockade will end. Now, this was a pretty big deal. One... It was a demonstration of our power and will. Like, we could have backed down, but we refused to do so. We fought and we pushed to keep West Berlin part of the free government of West Germany. Um, this also changes our viewpoint, or the viewpoint of these Germans on the Western Allies. No longer are we seen as the occupiers, uh, right? Uh, we're, we're partners. We're there to help protect them together to protect them from communist aggression uh, from the East. Um, now, in the immediate aftermath of this, the, the, the governments are fully formed. Uh, we see that the Western Allies will help create the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, what we will call uh, West Germany, usually. Um, and then, of course, in response to that, Stalin and the Soviets would push forward the creation of East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. The names are confusing. Of course, you know, communists, they call themselves Democratic Republic as well, um, although their democracy looks a lot different than it does in the West. Uh, don't worry so much, though, about their specific real names. If you call them West and East Germany, you're going to be fine for our purposes. Now, this will be very important also for Berlin and West Berlin itself. 
Uh, Berlin had long been Germany's largest city before the wars, of course, as well. Um, and for a while, and again today, it is the capital of Germany. Um, but the problem of West Berlin is not going to end with the Berlin Airlift in 1948. And instead, we'll see a later uh, comeback of this crisis in the early 1960s when uh, the Soviets, now under a new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, will begin the construction of a huge barrier around West Berlin to prevent the East Germans from crossing into it. Because by that point, there was a clear and documented problem of defectors trying to get into West Berlin so they could get on a train and get to the Western world and defect from the Eastern sphere, the communist Eastern sphere. Now, to stop that, the Soviets started building this in 1961 in bits and pieces. Eventually, over time, this Berlin Wall would become a very visible, clear dividing line. So unlike the Iron Curtain, this is like a real like dividing line that you can't cross. Uh, symbol of the Cold War itself, symbol of Soviet oppression. Um, now, at its peak, uh, the, the wall would be very large, uh, double walls on either side. In between, you'd have what you see here, the death strip, which would be uh, monitored by uh, uh, East German uh, guards to shoot anyone trying to cross. So called the death strip because if you made it to that middle zone, you were more likely to die than to make it through to the other side to West Berlin. Now we're jumping ahead here, and actually we're jumping into the content in period nine, but the Berlin Wall is not around anymore. Um, in November of 1989, the East German government, in the face of increasing challenges to their communist system, not just there but globally, will open the Berlin Wall uh, and allow people to pass through for the first time in uh, almost 40 years. Um, now, or almost 30 years, rather. Um, now, uh, this news caused huge demonstrations about mostly younger uh, East Germany, uh, East Germans and uh, West uh, Berliners as well, um, and they started to attack it uh, with hammers and sledgehammers, started to take down pieces of the Berlin Wall, um, and then eventually, and over time, the wall would be completely uh, destroyed, um, and now is more of a symbol of the reunification of Germany, which would occur in uh, 1990 as the Cold War was coming to an end. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there because, yes, the Cold War in Europe will end one day, um, but we're not quite there yet. With that said, though, next time we're going to keep talking about containment, but we're going to change our focus and look at how con uh, containment policy plays out in Asia. And while the same idea is there trying to stop the expansion of communism, what we're going to find is that in Asia... The, the goal of trying to stop the spread of communism is not going to be as successful, and we're going to have a lot more trouble trying to contain it there. But we'll talk about that next time. See you then. Bye!